Hi everyone, welcome back to the Med Student Success Step 1 Review. Today we'll be focusing on the high yield clinical presentations for the renal section. A lot of you have been asking me for a question bank and I've partnered with TrueLearn to offer you a really good discount. I'll have the link in the description box below and you can get $25 off using the discount code SUCCESS25. Okay, so let's get started. The first patient is going to have oligohydramnios, a flat face, pulmonary hypoplasia, and limb deformities. This is Potter's sequence. Next, we'll have a child with recurrent UTIs, renal scarring, and blunted calyces. This is vesico ureteral reflux. Next, we have a male newborn and prenatal ultrasound shows bilateral hydronephrosis and a distended bladder. This is posterior urethral valves. Next, we have a BUN to creatinine ratio of over 20 the phena of less than 1%, and causes include hypotension, hypovolemia, and renal artery stenosis. This is pre-renal azotemia. Next, we have a BUN to creatinine ratio of less than 15, phena of over 2%, and causes include glomulonephritis, pyelonephritis, and polycystic kidney disease. This is intrinsic renal failure. Next, we have a BUN to creatinine ratio of less than 15. Fena can be between 1 to 2%, and causes include stones. This is post-renal azotemia. Next, we have hypotension, BUN to creatinine ratio over 20, and muddy brown granular casts. This is ischemic acute tubular necrosis. Next, we have a patient that might be taking aminoglycosides, acyclovir, ethylene glycol, or rhabdomyolysis. The BUN to creatinine ratio is over 20, and we see muddy brown granular casts. This is nephrotoxic acute tubular necrosis. Next, we have a patient with uncontrolled hypertension. We hear a bruit in the flank and a high creatinine. This is renal artery stenosis. Next, we have a patient with high blood pressure, hematuria, proteinuria less than 3.5 grams per day, dysmorphic red blood cells and red blood cell casts, and the patient can have post-strep glomulonephritis, rapidly progressive glomulonephritis, or diffuse proliferative glomulonephritis. This is nephritic syndrome. This is often compared to the next presentation where the patient has edema, hypoalbuminemia, hypercoagulability, over 3.5 grams of uh, proteinuria per day, minimal change disease, membranous glomulonephritis, membranoproliferative glomulonephritis, focal segmental glomulosclerosis, amyloidosis, or diabetic glomular nephropathy. This is nephrotic syndrome. Next, we have a patient that has hematuria with red blood cells, no casts, proteinuria, Ig nephropathy, and Alport syndrome are examples of this. This is isolated hematuria. 
Next, we have a patient that presents over one week after an upper respiratory infection or impetigo, hematuria, dysmorphic red blood cell or red blood cell casts, biopsy will show hypercellular glomeruli, immunofluorescence is going to show granular with immunocomplex deposition, and electron microscopy will show subepithelial humps. This is going to be post-strep glomulonephritis. Next, we have a patient with hemoptysis and hematuria, vasculitis symptoms, progressive post-strep glomulonephritis. The biopsy will show crescents on immunofluorescence. Good pasture will have a linear pattern. Post-strep glomulonephritis will have a granular pattern and granulomatosis with polyangitis, eosinophilic granulomatosis, and microscopic polyangitis will all be negative. And on electron microscopy, post-strep glomulonephritis will have subepithelial humps, whereas the other ones will have no deposits. This is going to be rapidly progressive glomulonephritis. Next, we have a patient with a history of lupus, wire looping of the capillaries, a granular pattern on immunofluorescence, and subendothelial deposits. This is going to be diffuse proliferative glomulonephritis. Next, we have a patient with recent respiratory or GI tract infections, mesangial proliferation, Ig deposits in the mesangium, and mesangial immunocomplex deposition. This is IgA nephropathy, also called Berger disease. Next condition is X-linked dominant. The patient will have vision changes, hearing loss, glomulonephritis. Biopsy will show irregular thinning and thickening and splitting of the basement membrane. Immunofluorescence will be negative. And electron microscopy will show irregular thickening and longitudinal splitting of the basement membrane. This is Alport syndrome. Next, we'll have a patient who has a recent infection or develops it idiopathically. The biopsy will show normal glomeruli. Immunofluorescence will be negative. But on electron microscopy, we show effacement of the podocyte foot processes. This is minimal change disease. And oftentimes for this, they're going to show a kid who develops a glomulonephritis, and the key thing here is effacement of the podocyte foot processes. Next, we have a patient with antibodies to phospholipase A2 receptor, or it can be due to drugs like NSAIDs or penicillamine, or they might have a history of Hep B or Hep C. Biopsy will show diffuse capillary and glomerular basement membrane thickening. We see a granular pattern and a spike in dome appearance of subepithelial deposits. This is membranous nephropathy. Next, we have a patient with Hep B or Hep C, type 2 associated with C3 nephritic factor. Biopsy will show splitting and tram track appearance. We see granular pattern on immunofluorescence. Type 1 has subendothelial deposits, and type 2 has intramembranous deposits. So this is membranoproliferative glomulonephritis. Now we have a patient with HIV or IV drug use. Biopsy will show segmental sclerosis and hyalinosis. And we also see effacement of the podocyte foot processes. This is focal segmental glomulosclerosis. And remember to just look at the name. There's focal areas of sclerosis here. 
Next, we have a patient with hepatomegaly, nephrotic syndrome, and Congo red stain shows apple green biofringence. This is amyloidosis. Next, we have a patient with a history of diabetes, and we see nodular glomerulosclerosis, also known as Kimmelsteel Wilson lesions. So this is diabetic glomulonephropathy. Next, we have a patient with a fever, flank pain, costovertebral angle tenderness on physical exam, and the urinalysis shows white blood cells and positive leuk esterase. This is pyelonephritis. And remember, if it's just contained in the bladder where we don't have any flank pain and CVA tenderness, that would be cystitis. Next, we have a patient who's using NSAIDs or penicillin and develops eosinophilic casts in the urine. This is acute interstitial nephritis. Next, we have a patient with sickle cell, acute pyelonephritis, NSAID use or diabetes, who develops gross hematuria and sloughing of necrotic renal papillae. This is renal papillary necrosis. Next, we have a patient with flank pain, hematuria, high blood pressure, and this condition is associated with berry aneurysms. This is autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. Next, we have a patient with flank pain, colicky pain, rating to the groin, and hematuria. This is nephrolithiasis, also known as kidney stones. Next, we're going to talk about different types of stones. So in this one, there's a history of Crohn's disease, and there's an enveloped shaped stone. This is a calcium oxalate stone. Now we have a patient with a proteus or Klebsiella infection and a coffin lid shaped stone. This is an ammonium magnesium phosphate, also known as a struvite stone. Next, we have a wedge shaped stone. This is a calcium phosphate stone. Now we have a patient that has a history of gout or tumor lysis syndrome and a rhomboid shaped crystal. This is a uric acid stone. Next, we have ornithine, lysine, arginine found in the urine, hexagon-shaped stone, and the sodium cyanide nitroprusside test is positive. This is a cysteine stone. Next, we have a patient with flank pain, palpable mass, hematuria, They'll have a history of smoking. They might have a varicose seal on the left side. This produces PTHRP, ectopic erythropoietin, ACTH, and renin, and biopsy will show clear cells. This is renal cell carcinoma. Next, we have a child with a large palpable unilateral flank mass and they might develop hematuria. This is a nephroblastoma. Next, we have a patient that develops painless hematuria, and they might have a history of smoking or naphthylamine exposure. This is urothelial carcinoma of the bladder. 
The next patient also has painless hematuria, but they've had a recent travel to the Middle East with exposure to schistosoma hematobium. This is squamous cell carcinoma of the bladder. Now we're going to talk about different types of urinary incontinence. So the first patient is going to have leaking with sneezing, coughing, and valsalva. This is due to urethral hypermobility. And to treat, we do pelvic floor exercises called Kegel exercises. And we also advise weight loss. This is stress incontinence. Next, the patient's going to have an urge to void immediately. It's due to detrusor muscle overactivity. And to treat, we can try Kegel exercises, timed voiding, and anti-muscarinics like oxybutynin. This is urge incontinence. Next, we have a patient that has incomplete emptying of the bladder. They might have leaking of the urine, increased post-void volume, and to treat, we do catheterization, or if they have BPH, alpha blockers can help. This is overflow incontinence. Thank you so much for watching. Like always, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out and we'll see you in the next video. Good luck studying everyone.